I want you to open your Bible to the book of Colossians. And we're going to look at chapter 1. And we're going to read verses 19 on down to 23. And this morning, I want to talk to you all about the blood of Jesus. You know, whether you realize it or not, or whether the world realizes it or not, we all need Jesus. The world needs Jesus. Um, God our Father saw the human need and condition. He sent forth his son Jesus, so the word made flesh, and he dwelt among humanity, and we beheld his glory as that of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He was necessary, and he was what was need. That's where the word propitiation, that which was necessary. He was necessary to appease God's wrath and put us in a position where we can experience forgiveness and justification and redemption and then have access back to the Father. And so for all of us here, it's important that we see we need, God doesn't need us. We need him. The Lord doesn't need us. We need him. We need him. And it's important that we never forget this. God, I need you in my life. Colossians chapter 1, verse 19 to 23. Look at this. For it pleased the Father that in him, Jesus, all the fullness should dwell, and by him, Christ, to reconcile all things to himself. By him were the things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his what? Christ. So he makes peace with us and God through the blood of that was shed on Calvary, through the blood of his cross. And you, who, were, who once were alienated and enemies in your minds by wicked works, yet now he has what? Reconciled. In the body of his flesh through death to present you holy, blameless, and above reproach in his sight. He says, if, somebody say if. So he puts a condition here. And this is some of the problem that we have with certain factions within the body of Christ. Is they they take away the ifs. But there's conditions tied to things. And he says here, If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away. So that tells me there's a possibility that I can be what? Moved away. And are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. He says, if indeed you continue in the faith, he says, grounded. We've been talking about foundation, amen? He says, and steadfast. People that, are, that don't have fa- foundation, they're not steadfast, and they are double-minded. But we are steadfast and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which we heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, he says, of which Paul of which I, Paul, he said, became a minister. There's only peace with God through the blood of Jesus Christ. And so it doesn't matter. And and people can get upset and other religions can say that they have a pathway to God. But through our Bible, we are clear on this fact that there is only one way to the Father, and that is through his Son, Jesus Christ, and the blood that he shed to give us access. Can I have an amen? There's not many paths to God. There's one door, and we have to enter through that that God supplied us so that we can gain access. And what a blessing that God will give us access to him through his son, Jesus Christ, and then his sacrifice gives us not only access, but now we also begin to experience the transformation so that we can receive all the blessing that God has in store for our lives. 
And so we must never forget this. I need God. I need the Lord. I need the blood of Jesus. I need him in my life. It's not something that I can just, I can take it or leave it. I need him. I need him for my peace with God. There's only way, one way that I can receive my peace with God again, and that is through him because I was an enemy in my mind. And people know this. There's hostility towards God in people's minds because the old Adam in us that had received the rejection still seeks to live his life aside and apart with from God and that old Adam in us is always trying to regain dominion and place within us not to mention Satan himself the devil is constantly egging us on to turn away from God instead of turning to God to hide our sin instead of bringing it before God so God so we can confess it and turn from it repent of it and then allow God to do what he's trying to do in our lives that old Adam is going to tell you you don't need to pray about that the old Adam is going to tell you you don't need to go to church you don't need to worship you don't need to, you don't need God. You, you, can just, you can just cover your own sin. And, and instead of us running to God, the Adam and us, just like we find in Genesis, we run away from God. Adam, Adam, where are you? Where are you? And instead of us running to God, we run, our nature, human nature wants to pull us away from God instead of pushing us to God. And so we have to understand that this dynamic is fighting within us. Don't pray. Don't study. Don't seek God. Don't, don't, don't submit to God. Don't do the things that God is asking you to do. It's not just the devil telling us to do this. Our nature is flawed. And it's through the blood of Jesus that we have peace and then he helps us to overcome that enemy in us, and especially in our minds, by wicked works. He says, he, now he reconciles us. But this peace only comes through the blood of Jesus. If you want peace, you need the blood of Jesus. If you really, a lot of people are looking for peace. They're looking, I'm trying to find peace in my life. So, so if, I, if I just sleep with more people, I'll have peace. If I could just buy another this, I'll have peace. If I could just get rid of my, my spouse, I could have peace. If my kids would just move out, I could have peace. <laughs> if I could just get that house, I would just have peace. If I could just get the new job, if I could get another job, if I just get these people on the job are getting on my last nerve, if I could just get another job, I could have peace. Now, a lot of times our peace isn't something out here it's, it's sometimes we're, we don't have peace because we're not in right relationship with God. And we blame it on everything else, but really it's just, man, I got to get my life right with God. That's the reason why I don't have peace. That's the reason why I don't have peace on my job or in my home or in my marriage or in my this or my that. It's not my kids. It's not everybody else. It's you can have all kinds of mess with around you and still have peace because your walk with Christ is right. Can I have an amen? My relationship with God is right. That's what gives me peace. But wait a minute. You have all this chaos, but it's not affecting my peace. Can I have an amen? But it's through the blood of Jesus that we have access to this peace with God that surpasses all understanding that guards our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. It's, it's, it's that. It's the blood of Jesus that gives us access to this peace, helps to renew our minds, and helps us to come out of feeling like and being an enemy in our minds. And now sets us in a stable foundation and gives us great peace with God. There's a lot of stuff going on, but I still got peace. Why are you not afraid? Why are you not going crazy? Why are you not lost? Because I got peace with God. Is God in the building? Then we're going to be all right. Is God in the car? Then we're going to be all right. Is God on the plane? Then sit back and enjoy the ride. 
Can I have an amen? It's God in my marriage, then we are gonna be all right. It's God with my kid, yes, will you be fine? If there's a peace that surpasses all understanding. People start thinking that you don't care when you don't flip out like them. I care, but I've cast my cares upon the Lord, for he cares for me, and the blood of Jesus has given me access to this peace, so I'm not tripping like you. Can I have an amen? And what happens is God just gives us a peace because your relationship with him is right. And if you have God, you have everything you need. Can I have an amen? If you have God, you have everything you need. Jesus came, and it says here, and by him, verse 20, to reconcile all things to him, by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. He's talking about peace with God our Father. That peace has come through the blood of Jesus. We have to receive that. Now, the devil's not going to tell you that. He's not going to let you know that you really should be having peace right now, but you don't because you're listening to me instead of listening to God. You don't, have a rela- you don't have a revelation of the blood. When we have that revelation of the blood, we know that we have instant access to God. And we have peace through his shed blood. Can I have an amen? Another thing that we have to see, let's go here when it c- comes to the blood of Jesus. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 2. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 2. The blood of Jesus Christ helps us to to gain that peace with God that that we need. But also something else here is restored. Look at verse 11 on down to 18. He says, therefore, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope. And without God in the world, what he's basically saying is the nation of Israel received the covenants and the blessings and the promises. The Gentile nations did not receive that at that time. And when it says circumcision and uncircumcision, the the Israel were considered the circumcised and the Gentiles were considered the uncircumcised. He says, they had the commonwealth of these promises and blessings. And at that time, the Gentiles were alienated. They didn't have those blessings. He says here, he says, but now in Christ, verse 13, you who were once far off have been made, have been brought near by what? The blood of Christ. He says, for he himself is our what? Peace. Who has made both the Jews and the Gentiles one. And has broken down the middle wall of what? Separation. So the Jews, when God looks at the Jews and Gentiles, he sees them for who they are, but he's made them one in Christ. So the church is composed of Jews and Gentiles coming together as one in Christ. And Christ is the one who's broken down the wall of separation. He says here, look in verse 15, having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances so as to create in himself one new man from the two. Thus making what? Peace. So we have peace with God. We also now through Christ, we learn to have peace with one another. Nationalities should have peace with one another in Christ. Because Christ is not, and I keep saying this, and people don't like it, but I'm going to read my Bible and share it with you. God's not looking at your skin color. 
He's looking for the blood. And where he finds the blood, he, he helps to bring peace. So what happens is for all of us, we have to see that praise God for my nationality, but I don't trace my lineage just back to who I am in the natural. Before I was in my mother's womb, God knew me. Can I have an amen? Y'all better ask somebody. Before that. So we got to learn to trace ourselves a little bit further back. And, all, and I praise God for my skin color. I praise God. And, and I'm, I guarantee you, you'd be hard-pressed to find more people that have traced back their genealogy farther back than I have. Ancestry.com, baby. <laughs> and so I've seen some things. But, but having, having that understanding also helps me to even be even more blessed to think how God came in. How God came in. And, and what happens is he's taken the Jews and the Gentiles. He's taken and he's broken down the separation and the, and the walls and the barriers and the, and the racism and, the, and all the other stuff that's taken place and the hatred and the enmity and all this other stuff. He says, all of you are one in Christ. Can I have an amen? amen. And this is what he's saying here. And it's such a blessing. He says in verse 16, and, having, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, therefore putting to death the what? The enmity. There should be no fighting. Because in Christ, we are one. Through the blood of Jesus, he has made us one. He says, and he came and preached peace to you who are afar off and to those who were near. He's talking about those who are far off, the Gentiles, and those who are near, the Jews. For through him we both have access by one spirit to who? To the Father. So it's through him we have access. It's through the blood of Jesus we have access. So write this down. Our fellowship is restored. Our fellowship with one another should be restored through the blood of Jesus. We have peace through the blood, but now our fellowship is restored through the blood of Jesus. Our fellowship with one another, and then I'm getting ready to talk about our fellowship with God is restored, but our fellowship with one another. We got to stop. The blood of Jesus Christ should, should alleviate and free us from any prejudice, bias, anything in our hearts towards another race it should break down and shatter if you say you're a Christian and you hate another ra race you're hard pressed to be a Christian because I don't know how you're going to do it in heaven when there are multitudes of people of all kinds of different nations and nationalities coming together and the whole earth is full of it you're not going to make it you're not going to make it can I have an amen, yeah? You're not going to. So if you have hatred in your heart, then what you don't understand, the blood of Jesus isn't profiting you. It's not, it's, not, it's not bringing you what it should be bringing you. And it's not the blood's fault. It's something in your heart that's the fault. It's the blood. The blood is it. You're not letting it do what it was designed to do, and that is to cut off the enmity and cut off the separation and bring you to a place where you start to see everybody through God's eyes. Oh, I feel that. Oh. You start looking at people through God's eyes, and you start seeing human beings that were created in the image and likeness of God. And you start seeing people that knew God be, or that God knew before they were in their mother's womb. You start looking at people differently. You start viewing people with, with God's eyes, and then what does it do? It, it frees the person, but most importantly, it frees you of any hatred. Of anything that would cause you to look at another nationality with contempt. That, that, that the, this, is what, this is what God does through his word. He liberates us. He frees us from those things that bind. And I want to say this, and, and most people, some of the people that have had discussions with me, they, they know I had, I grew up in a family where, 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 um, 
My grandfather, he did not like people of another race. And my family, I can just remember him saying things about people of other races. And it baffled me because some of my, my good friends were people of other races. I was like, well, why is he talking bad about them? That's my buddy. He, right. he, I love that guy. Right. He's my friend. He's my teammate. Why is he doing that? I can remember that. And then, and then I can remember how the devil would try to come to me and say, well, you need to hate him too. <laughs> See, hatred of another race is something that is learned. <laughs> something that's taught you don't trust them don't do this it's something that's taught you it's the it's not something because when you study history and you study the bible and just history in general most people groups on the planet have in some way experienced some type of injustice by another people group or another race. Do you know that there's slavery that's going on right now in this country? So, so it's not like, like your race, no matter what race you are, is the only race that has experienced something wrong. No matter what race. Because every humans have abused humans for years. But it's the blood of Jesus Christ that comes to help us to receive reconciliation and healing and deliverance from the bitterness and the hatred and all the other things that puts us against one another. He wants to, through the blood, bring peace. So that there's a peace. That's why, man, I just love our church. Because you look around and you see, you see how God has, will come in and change people's hearts and helped him to see that God's family is a huge family. And it's not just a white family. And it's not just a black family. And it's not just a Filipino family. And it's not just a Japanese or a Chinese family. It's the family of God composed of Jews and Gentiles. Can I have an amen, y'all? Of all races and the multitudes of people from all generations. And it's the blood of Jesus Christ that helps us to arrive at that place of peace. That's what he's saying. But not only just peace with one another, but peace with God. Go to 1 John chapter 1. We begin to have peace with God and a fellowship with God. We have a peace and a fellowship with one another, but we have a peace and a fellowship with God. 1 John chapter 1. Verses 1 to 4. He says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled, concerning the word of life. The life was manifested. He's talking about Jesus. And we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have what? Fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. So we have fellowship with one another and we have peace with one another through the blood of Jesus. And through the blood of Jesus, now we have fellowship with God our Father. We have fellowship with his Son. Now, fellowship, koinonia. There's a union there that we begin to experience with God that begins to follow us all the days of our lives. That we're stopped looking for God and we start enjoying him. Think about what I'm saying. We stop constantly looking for God and we just start enjoying him. God's not way over there, over there, over there. God is right in here. He's with us. He says, I will dwell among them and walk among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. That God is in our midst and we just start enjoying God as he dwells in our midst instead of always running to try to find him somewhere. 
I want God to be with me in my car. Can I have an amen? I want him to be with me when I wake up in the morning. I want to feel the presence of God, that I have fellowship with God, that my koinonia with God is never broken. Well, through the blood of Jesus, he gives us fellowship. We have this fellowship and blessing and unity and peace with our brothers. But most importantly, we have fellowship with God. He says, truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son. And for all of us, we want to enjoy that. Stop telling people that you're lonely. I just feel so lonely. Well, maybe your, your feelings are lying to you because you got the God of the universe who said he will never leave you, nor for, can I have an end, nor forsake you, and he's dwelling right there with you. Now, you might want some other friends, and that's fine, but, but is God's company not, so his is just Swiss cheese? You better enjoy God. And God will send some people to, but there's a place in you that is only reserved for God that you can talk to people to you're blue in the face and have all your friends around, but, but they cannot satisfy you completely. Can I have an amen? The way only God can do. So I get it when I hear people say that, but I want to remind you that don't be mistaken. You are never alone if you have God in your life. And this fellowship is what we want to learn to enjoy. You know, sometimes my wife and the kids, they catch me around the house talking to myself. And they think I'm talking to myself, but I'm not always talking to myself, honey. I'm not crazy. I'm talking to God. And sometimes I'm talking to God saying, God, help me. I'm trying to fix this car. It's not working. God, what should I do with this? You think I should do it? Now, I don't hear nothing, but I just keep on talking sometimes. I know what you think, Lord. And, and then you start making it a practice that, that God is with you, and you start to communicate with God as if he's with you because you know he's with you, and you begin to let God know that, God, I value our relationship. Can I have an amen? And I thank you for being with me at all times. Man, I just feel the anointing on that right there. I just, I just feel that. Let's go to Galatians chapter 5 because this is also important for us. Galatians chapter 5. And we want to see here because one of the problems that we have in the Bible I shouldn't say in the Bible, I should say one of the problems that we have is that our character is marred. It's flawed. And it's through the blood of Christ that he restores our character. He helps us, but we have to be real with what we're dealing with in terms of our old nature and our fallen nature. We have to be honest that if God had not come into your life, no telling where you would be right now. You don't even want to think about it. Some people right now are saying, I'm right in the midst of it. I'm trying to come out of this. And what happens for all of us is we have to see that our character is flawed. You do not have to teach. Nobody taught you to sin. Our nature is flawed. And so we need restoration, and it's through the blood of Jesus that he cleanses us and then cleanses our consciences of all of our, our, our dead works. He starts to free us. But I have to be honest, Lord, without you, I'm a total mess. I need God. It's not a matter of just, you know, it's a matter of survival. And watch what he says here. Galatians chapter verse 16 he says I say then walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh for the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh and they are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish but if you are led by the spirit you are not under the law 
He says, now the works of the flesh are evident. He says, which are, he says, adultery. Adultery in its base form is a work of the flesh. He says, adultery. He says, fornication. When we're going out and sleeping with people and we are not married to, that's, we're fornicating. And when we're fornicating, you are crossing a line and unlawfully, now watch this here, joining yourself together with somebody else for temporary pleasure. But people fail to re- forget, when you fornicate, then what you're doing and adultery, you're creating a soul tie with that person. And when you create a soul tie, you're joining your soul together with that person. And you may have no desire to stay with that person for the rest of your life. But yet now your soul has been fractured and broken. Now you're up thinking about that person that don't even think about you anymore. Now you're up and there, there's an emotional tie there now that has been created that can put your life in a tailspin. And then the next thing you know, you're, you're having to try to... And I hate this, so hate this to say this, but, but now it's harder for you to get peace internally because now the devil, he plays on that and your soul has been disjointed. That's why David prayed the prayer and declared, and he restores my soul. Our souls need restoration. If you're fornicating and committing adultery, then there's a soul tie that needs to be broken and annihilated so you can get your peace back. Can I have an amen? And, and so for all of us, it's important that we realize that. He said, this is a work of the flesh. If you're fornicating, you're just being in the flesh. He says here, not only fornication, he says uncleanness. He said lewdness, and you see this, lewdness has just become the order of the day. Everybody wants to get naked. Everybody's naked. And I'm saying, put some clothes on. And you can't even go to 24-hour fitness no more. And I'm not talking about just the women, I'm talking about the guys. Brother, put a shirt on. You think you Hulk Hogan up in here? (laughs) But lewdness is now just a part of society where everybody just doesn't mind being naked. And you can't watch a commercial. Can I have an amen, y'all? But it's just the flesh. It's just the flesh making making itself known. And this is a character flaw. God doesn't want us to walk around like mummies neither. But there is a place for decency and being classy and professional. Can I have an amen? There's a place for that that is a healthy place where you value yourself. And you value, your, the, you value yourself to the point that you're willing to cover yourself to a certain point so that everybody doesn't get to see you. Certain things should be reserved only for you and your spouse. Can I, you want people to wonder. Can I have an amen? amen. And, and if, if you're married in the room, you should, I mean, it, it's, it's. It's a matter of respect also. Can I have an amen? It's a matter of respect that when you're dressing, you're not just dressing for how you feel. You're dressing saying, I wonder, I, okay, well, my, my wife is cool with this too. You know what I mean? Because I want to make sure I'm respectful. I can't show everything. Can I have an amen? And it's the same thing for the wives. You know. It's it's important that we realize that because lewdness, this is a work of the flesh, and this is what's coming forth. And then if we start talking like this, which I just read here, it said lewdness, right? Then if I say something, oh, he being legalistic. How am I being legalistic? I just read lewdness was a work of the flesh. So I didn't write it. Be mad at God and see how far that gets you. God just wants us to be respectful. And then I know, I know nobody in this room wants to cause somebody else to stumble, do you? 
You don't want to do anything to cause somebody else to stumble. He says here, he says, lewdness, he says, idolatry. He says, sorcery is a work of the flesh. Hatred. Hatred is a work of the flesh. He says, not only hatred, but contentions. When you're always fighting and contentions and stuff, somebody is in the flesh. Jealousy, outbursts of wrath. He says, this is a work of the flesh. Self-ambitions. Self-ambitions can is a work of the flesh. He says here, not only self-ambitious, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in times past, that those who practice, somebody say practice, who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Wow. <laughs> he gets against such there is no law. He says, and those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, <laughs> envying one another. Can I have an amen? amen? The blood of Jesus comes to give us power over our flesh. To reconcile us and then begin to do away with our moral character so that we embrace the fruit of God's spirit. And then now when people get around us, they start to see the love, the joy, the peace, the patience, the kindness, the goodness, the self-control. They start to see all these things. And what happens is we can testify that it's the blood of Jesus that gave me access to this. We need the blood because the blood helps to, to cure our character issue and it helps to free our conscience from the past works, the things that we used to do. When you know that you're really free in God when you can begin to talk about the things that you used to do and not feel like you got to hide it anymore. I don't mind telling people about all my failures. I don't mind telling people about who I used to be because I'm not that. Can I have an amen? And when you know that God is free, what happens is a freedom, and then you can testify and help to bring somebody else at, out of their mess. It's important for us to allow God to use the blood as a tool to help to cleanse us so that we truly do reflect him in the earth. And then we can testify. The same God that delivered me from this is the same God that can deliver you. Can I have an amen? The same God that set me free is the same God. And he did it through the power of the blood of Jesus. He came forth and gives you access to a new character. Amen. So when people get around you, they say, man, they just got so much joy. So much love and peace. They got patience. I remember they, they weren't patient. They're patient. It must have been God in their life. Self-control. They used to be wild. And now they got some self-control. They used to be lewd. They walk around half naked. But now they didn't put some clothes on. Some. There's a place for that. But you know, people, I mean, it's, it's important that we realize this is what God's doing. He doesn't want us to be mummies, but there's something in you that now we are always thinking about God and how to be a blessing to other people. Can I have an amen, y'all? Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1 to 4. So we have our fellowship and peace with God and with one another. Our character through the blood of Jesus is restored, and, and God delivers us from our flesh. But this is another point that's important. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1 on down. He says, therefore, since we have this ministry as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. 
But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the, no the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Look at verse 4 very closely here. This is important. Whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe. Lest the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on him. When Adam sinned, he not only lost his fellowship with God and his union and intimacy with God, but he also lost his dominion. He lost his right to rule. He gave that over to the devil when he chose to listen to the devil's command. And suggestion. And so one of the things that's happened is, is that for all of us here, the Bible clearly calls the devil or Satan the little G God of this age. Okay? How did he get that? Because Adam gave it up. He gave up his, his rule and his reign. God had given him authority and commandment and given him power and instruction concerning the earth, but the enemy came in and usurped that power, received it deceitfully, and now the Bible calls him the God of this age, okay? Not big G, little G, but he has received, he took the dominion. Well, for us, one of the things that happens for us is we have to realize that the blood of Jesus Christ gives us, I want to say this right, Gives us our dominion back. Gives us the right to rule back. Okay? In Christ. Now, this is important, saints. Now, please hear me because the devil, he knows what I just said to you, but he wants to constantly keep you in a position where you're subject to him. Okay? Where you're subject to him. But Jesus, when he came on the scene, the thing I love was, is that Jesus came on the scene, and he was a lamb, but he was also a warrior. Now, track with me, y'all. So when he saw the enemy in people's lives wreaking havoc, tearing up his creation, Jesus was a warrior, and he began to fight back. How did he fight back? He cast out demons. He lived a perfectly perfect life. He began to uh, expose and bring light and bring truth and revelation to people to help bring them out of darkness into his marvelous light. Well, for us, this is one of the things that God does through the blood of Jesus. He restores our dominion. Stop taking mess from the devil in your life. Can I have an amen? Stop letting the devil come in and mess with your mind, mess with your heart, mess with your finances, mess with your thoughts, mess with your body, and mess with stuff. You start fighting the devil. Ooh, I feel an anointing on this right now. You start fighting the devil back and help him to understand that I see you and I see what you're trying to do in my life. I'm not going to let you get me on drugs. I'm not going to let you get me all messed up. I'm not going to let you mess up my marriage and my finances and my kids and my house. I'm not letting you break up stuff like you used to because the blood of Jesus Christ was shed and has now given me dominion and authority and power over the enemy. Can I have an amen, y'all? We got to learn how to fight back. It's the blood that positions you. You're not fighting in your own strength. You're fighting with, the, with the, uh, the nature and character of God. You're fighting with the Holy Spirit. You're fighting with the Word of God. You're fighting with the power of God. You're not standing there alone. Do you know how many angels surround you when you're fighting? Goodness. Well, what the problem is is that the church, we become toothless. We got a lot of bark, but we got to get some bite in us. 
Devil, you come in my house, I will run you out of there so fast. I'll run you out with the word of God. I'll run you out with some prayer. I'll run you out with fasting. I'll run you out with consecration. I'll run you out with some healing. I'll cast every demon out of my house. I'll cast them out of my kids. I'll cast them out of the dog. I'll cast them out of the cat. I'll cast the devil out. If I see, can I have an amen? Woo! I feel this. When I see the devil, I'll cut his head off. I'm casting them all out. There's got to be something. Can I have an amen? We got to get some bark back in us and some bite too. We got to get some bite in us. <laughs> Crying isn't working for you, baby. You better pick up the word of God and say, devil, you spirit of depression trying to come up in my house. I bind you in the name of Jesus. God is not giving me a spirit of fear. I rebuke fear. I rebuke death and destruction. I bind it in the name of Jesus. There's something the dominion has been given back. Said the God of this age has blinded the mind of those. Jesus came to give us insight into this warfare and say, hey, listen, your dominion is given back. Don't let the devil have his place in your life. Stop tolerating it. Don't tolerate it. And sometimes, now watch this, y'all, and we're going to move on. But sometimes before you can have peace, you got to have a war. Take your family back. Luke chapter 4. Look at this. Luke chapter 4. Let me hear you. Luke chapter 4. The blood of Jesus helps to give us our dominion back. Watch Jesus here. Look at this picture. Luke chapter 4, verse 1. And Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness, being tempted for 40 days by the devil. And in those days he he ate nothing. And afterwards, when they had ended, he was hungry. And the devil said to him, if you are the Son of God, command these stones to become Bread, the devil is always going to question your identity. He says, if. So you have to know who you are. Stop acting like you're still in the world and you're still carnal and you're still some person that's in the streets. You've given your life to Jesus. You have, been, you have been brought into the kingdom of God and the household of God and the family of God. And you are no longer an orphan, but the spirit of God has come to you. So stop acting like you're, no, I'm a Christian. I'm not in the world anymore. I'm not some worldly person. I'm a man of God. I'm anointed by God. I'm chosen by God, handpicked by God. God has filled me with his spirit. You got to start telling yourselves that. And stop trying to be what you see everybody else being on TV. Jesus wasn't confused in his identity. He says, but the devil will always ask you who you are if you be the son of God. Command these stones to become bread. He's saying, prove it in some way. But Jesus answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Then the devil taking him up on a high mountain showed him all the kings of this world in a moment of time. And the devil said, all uh, all this authority has been given, no, excuse me, and the devil said, all this authority I will give you and their glory, for this has been delivered to me. How did he get it? Because of Adam's fall. And I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all will be yours. See, this is the thing, too. Let me stop here. Stop thinking that just external blessings only come from God sometimes the devil will bless you or give you something to keep you going down the wrong path (laughs) 
And if it don't come on, I'll just preach without it. Is it there? One, two, one, two. Uh-huh. The devil don't like this. We're going to get it. We're going to get it. We're going to get it real good. We're going to get it real good. And if this might go out, I'm going to speak a cappella. Uh-huh. He says here, therefore, if you'll worship me, verse 7, all will be yours. And Jesus answered and said, get behind me, Satan, for it is written. He says, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you will serve. Amen? Amen. Him only you shall serve. Then he brought him to Jerusalem and, he, and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered and said to him, it has, it has been said, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Now with the, when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. So he's always looking for another opportunity. But for us, it's important that we see that Jesus was able to fend him off by constantly going to the word of God as his reference tool. For everything the enemy was throwing at him. And we have to make sure we do the same thing, even when confronting the enemy and, and taking his dominion out of our lives. He wants to dominate you. He wants to have dominion over you. But you don't give him that place. You don't tolerate it. Jesus didn't tolerate him. And Jesus didn't leave. The devil left. So the Bible says resist the devil and he will what? He'll flee from you. You get him on the run. You don't run nowhere. You get him on the run. Can I have an amen? I'm not leaving my house. You're leaving my house. I'm not going nowhere. You're going somewhere. I'm not leaving my job. You're leaving the job. I'm not going anywhere because God. God gives you dominion. We got to learn how to walk in that. Stop, stop just having pity parties all the time and think God's going to sympathize with you. Why should he sympathize with you when he gave you everything you need to beat the devil down? Get up and start using the tools that God you gave you. He gave it to you so you can have dominion. Well, the blood of Jesus helps to get us back to that place. Can I have an amen? amen. The last thing we're going to address is found in Romans chapter 5. This is important. We're going to end with this. Romans chapter 5, verse 19 and 21. It says here in verse 19. For as by one man's disobedience, Adam, many were made sinners. So also by one man's obedience, Christ, many will be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ, he says, our Lord. For by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. Through the blood of Jesus. Now watch this. The blood of Jesus also gives us, ah, I love this, gives us, it gives us access um, and I wrote, I wrote down here, I want you guys to know what I, what I wrote down here. What I wrote down were here was when Adam sinned, he began to beget sinful offspring. So what I want you to write is righteous offspring. When God saves you spiritually and naturally, what he's looking for is righteous offspring through you. So, so one man's disobedience resulted in all of us being affected. One man's righteousness 
resulted in whosoever will let him come, now they begin to experience righteousness. Now, this righteousness that through the blood Jesus has purchased for us, now he wants you to go forth and bring forth much fruit. So now you have to start thinking that you are in this room, and whether naturally or spiritually, you are going to have offspring. Think about this and how powerful it is. You're going to have offspring. And your offspring, we want our spiritual or natural offspring to reflect righteousness, the righteousness that we have obtained in Christ through the blood. We want that righteousness to begin to spring forth in their, their lives. I want my kids to be righteous. I want my spiritual sons and daughters to live righteously before God. Now, now, when you start doing this, now watch this, y'all. When you start really living like that, it starts to deliver you from selfishness. And you really begin to walk in love because you're living in a path that is designed to not just prosper you, but you have to be also thinking about the generations that are coming through. Can I have an amen, y'all? Now, now, now you start to go to another place in God when you start envisioning and imagining in your mind three and four and five generations down the line. And you start telling yourself, this decision isn't just for me, it's for this person down there. And that the generations and the generations and the generations to come can be blessed. You start telling yourself that it's just not about me right now. That sometimes the blessing that God has promised you is going to come through you, though you may never see it. And you start thinking in your mind that what I'm setting myself up for generations to come, I'm not just living for my now. That's when you start to become mature. When you start to come of age in God. When your decisions aren't just based on how it's going to make you feel in the now, but your mind is thinking, what about three and four generations down the road? That God, you saved me, and it wasn't just for me, but there's three or four generations down the road that you've been thinking about. So many people. And, and stop thinking, well, it, it just, it's just the preachers that do that. No, it's you. Well, pastor, I just got saved. But God wasn't just thinking about you. Who else needs to be saved through you? Who else needs the blood? through you who else this needs to experience Jesus through you by one man's sin many were made unrighteous many were affected but one ma by one man's righteousness many will be made right so what happens is now you got you got if one will put a thousand to flight two will put two thousand to flight if God just got me I know he wasn't just thinking about me so who else needs to be saved through me who needs to be saved on this job I'm not just here to collect checks Somebody about to get filled with the Holy Ghost up in here and get delivered and get their mind right. Who in here needs to be saved in this household? It's not just me that, God, you saved me. You want mama, daddy, cousin, dog, the bird, and the cat. God, everybody. You want everybody. Who else needs to be? There's something in your mind that starts to go beyond just you. And the blood of Jesus gives you access to this and helps us to see that the blood isn't just for me. And that coworker keep on getting on my nerves. Amen. You know what? And I know what's happening. And I always watch this. Saints, the one that gives you the biggest problem, that's the one that's real close to getting saved. And they just need somebody just to, just to cross right over the line and let them know. This guy at the store, I'm going to share this. This guy at the store, he, he grumpy old man. And I saw him being grumpy to everybody. I'm barking at everybody. I said, oh, Tom, how you doing, Tom? Hey, buddy, how you doing? Oh, I'm doing all right, all right. I said, oh, yeah, I'm going to get you, brother. You be mean. There's something, and then there's something in us that's got to say, okay, this person thinks, see, the devil's trying to, that tough exterior is trying to get them to run away from me. But I'm going to run to them. I'm going to run to him. Now when Tom see me, 
Napoleon, how you doing, buddy? How you doing? Give me a hug, man. How you doing? Come on, man. What's going on? And I'm saying to myself, yeah, I got you smiling, but I'm trying to get you in the house of God. Can I have an amen? There's something that we got we to gotta start getting ourselves to a place where we start breaking through barriers because of the blood. Because why? We want some righteous offspring. Yes. By one man, many were made unrighteous. Many were fell. But now by one man, now God gives us opportunity. Now, just think you have a thousand people. This is what it's about. And so this morning, as, I, as, I, as, I, as we talk about the blood, never forget that your, the blood of Jesus comes to give you a relationship with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Stop hating each other because of your skin color. Amen. And because of what's happened in the past and history. All kinds of nations have experienced all kinds of injustices and all kinds of levels. And there's all kinds of stuff that goes on this day. Our brothers and sisters in countries right now are being killed and burned alive and thrown into prison unjustly. And they are our brothers and sisters in Jesus. And we want to make sure that we allow God to give us peace with one another. And then peace with him. Can I have an amen? amen. Saints, our character was flawed, but it takes the power of the blood to come in and cleanse us and to wash us. Stop letting the devil have dominion over you. You take dominion over him. And use the word of God as a sword to push him back. And don't tolerate it. Jesus' blood came to give you access to your renewed and restored dominion. Walk in that dominion. And make sure that you're constantly thinking when it comes to the blood that the blood of Jesus Christ came to me, but it wasn't just for me. It's also that somebody else, God's looking for righteous offspring. And so, Lord, we thank you today for the power of your blood. We thank you that the blood never loses its power and that from generation to generation that the blood still works, that there's nobody that's above or beyond the blood of Jesus. That, Lord, no matter how sinful we have been in our past, no matter how bad we have been, there is nothing that can hinder the power of your blood as we receive it and walk in it. Your blood cleanses and it heals and it washes, it restores, it helps to bring restoration and a clarity of vision in our hearts and minds. We thank you that when the blood was put upon the doorpost of the children of Israel, as they came out of Egyptian captivity, that the death angel could not touch their house because of the blood. And we just declare today that the devil cannot touch our house because of the blood of Jesus. That he has to pass by because of the power of the blood of Jesus. The blood insulates us just like the Ark of the Covenant. Just like the, the, the Ark that Noah built. That there's safety in the blood. And we praise you, Lord, that you're raising up a church that's not afraid to talk about the blood. To prophesy concerning the blood. To make declarations concerning the blood. And to acknowledge the power of the shed blood of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. We thank you that your blood was sufficient and it was necessary and that we have propitiation of sin through the power of your blood. You appeased God, our Father's wrath through the power of the blood. We thank you that we are covered in the blood and that no weapon that is formed against us shall prosper because the blood of Jesus Christ still works. And I thank you, Lord, for your dear people, help us to walk in this truth and live out the realities, the power of the blood of Jesus. We need you, Jesus. We need your blood. We thank you for who you are in Jesus' name. Can somebody say amen this morning? Come on, everybody stand to your feet. This morning, what I want to do is I want to take some time and we're going to pray for people that are sick in your body or somebody that you know is sick in their body and you want to pray for them and stand in the gap for them. And we want to ask 
for the blood of Jesus Christ to bring total healing. It could be emotional, physical, whatever it is, spiritual. This morning, we want to have some time just to open the altar so we can stand in the gap for people that need healing in their body. Altar workers, invoke the blood of Jesus. And let's believe God to do something great this morning. If you're in the room, come on down to the altar right now. We want to pray and stand in the gap. Come on, altar workers, make your way down so we can pray for people. And let's believe God to do something for them. God bless you all. May he bless and keep you as my prayer. Be blessed. Come on, let's find somebody.